So this clinic is going to be on low socioeconomic considerations, and I really wanted to do a clinic because for those of you that are here in person, those of you online, we have people here in person, and I asked, um, one of my questions I asked you is what type of socioeconomic situation are you in, and it was about half and half, so I wanted to make sure that we had something specifically for people just kind of to address that and to give us a chance to talk about it. Sometimes it's a tough situation to talk about, you don't want to say the wrong thing, you want to make sure that you're helping those kids the same way you would help anyone else, but they do have special things that um, you just need to consider and keep in mind. And so when I decided to do this clinic, the person I wanted to do it is Annette. Um, she is a good friend of mine. We've gone to get, uh, college together, but more than that, we taught together our first year, and we she were in was Plano. At my wedding. I was at a yes, <laughs> <laughs> I was at a very high socioeconomic school, brand new school, just opened, wonderful school, and has done great things since then. She was at a neighboring school, totally <laughs> different situation, even in the same district. And ever since then, I've seen what a heart she has for kids that. Are, um, just have that extra need as far as home. And she'll talk about that, but whether it's financial or home support or whatever, um, that is really kind of her niche, and she's wonderful at dealing with um, situations and supporting students through situations like that. So she's going to give you a little bit of information about that. So here's Annette. Okay. Hello, everybody online. This feels just like school this last year. Um, so thank you guys for letting me come talk to you about this topic. This is my favorite is thing. Okay. Um, actually, I think when we originally started, she was like, you can be my low brass person. I'm like, okay, great. And I wrote a couple of brass articles. And then I kept writing low socio things and going, hey, um, what about this? And she's like, great. And so pretty soon I became the low socio person. It wasn't on purpose. It's just where my heart is. Um, and I keep finding myself at low socio schools and I watch my friends who choose to go to other schools where it might be a little different teaching and they pick those schools for the reasons they pick it and I pick these schools for the very same and opposite reason. Um, and so you'll get a handout in a minute, it's coming, he copied the wrong one. <laughs> so, but. Um, my big important thing for you to understand is teaching low socioeconomic and at-risk kids is not what you think it is. And there's this stigma that has been pervasive lately and has been put in our faces a little bit by accident from people that just don't have experience working with these kids. They, I don't think they even mean anything negative about it. They just don't know any better. Um, and so I, I want to open with a quote from Eric Jensen. Eric Jensen has written tons of things on working with low socioeconomic students, working with at-risk students, encouraging them, teaching them to have a different mindset. Um, and so his definition of poverty, I love this, poverty is a chronic experience resulting from an aggregate of adverse social and economic risk factors. It's an experience. It's not who they are. It doesn't stop them from being successful. It's just what they're living through. Um, I remind my students all the time, because my students, I'm in the 80 to 85% low socio. We're almost to free lunch all the time, which this year we were. Um, but we're free breakfast every day. Um, we will be free lunch, I think, this year, um, because we're opening a new school and splitting some things up. And it's going to actually increase our numbers to a place where they get to eat, to eat free lunch, which is huge because these kids go home and don't have food. And luckily this year during COVID, they've actually had take home packets of food for these kids to take home for the nights and weekends, which has been a big deal because these kids literally don't eat. And I can tell you from experience, even this year, we have a drawer with food in it for kids that come in and they are just so hangry they can't function. And they'll come in, get a granola bar from my assistant because she's awesome, and then they're good for class. Um, so I remind my kids, and this, I think back to a student I had that confided in to, to me that she had become homeless. Um, and she was very embarrassed, mortified about it. Um, and worse than that, she was living with her mom and mom's boyfriend in a hotel. And they were moving hotel to hotel as they couldn't pay it for the day. Um, but dad was also living in another hotel across town. And so there was really no place for her to go. There was no money to be had. And she was just mortified and embarrassed and didn't want her friends to know. And it was really messing with her ability to function in school. And she and I sat down and I looked at her and I said, look, being homeless is a situation. It's not who you are. It's what's happening right now. And more than that, you don't have any control over that situation because you're 12. 
And we have to remember that about these kids. When they're 10, 11, 12, even 15, 16, 17, 18, they don't have control over the situation. It is the situation they're experiencing. And we have the ability to give them the tools to change their situation and take control of it at the very first opportunity to get out and do their own thing. And that's why I do what I do, because I can give them the tools to choose what their next step is going to be after they leave school. Um, so I want to talk about the differences first, because I have worked with friends who work with a different population. We talk all the time about how our populations are similar and different. We talk about ways that teaching works the same and different. Um, and so the first thing I want to talk about is the toolbox these kids come with, okay? Um, and you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if you feel differently about this, but I view the toolbox that our students with a higher socioeconomic situation they come with is this big toolbox full of tools that's not necessarily organized, but their parents and their support system have been filling this toolbox throughout their whole life, giving them like tools to be able to deal with situations. And then my students come to me and it's more like one of those Gerber knives, one of those multi-tools. They have a whole bunch of tools, but they don't look like they really do much and they don't know how to use them for much of anything other than the situations that they're in. Okay, um, so my multi-tool children, they're probably raising their siblings at home. They probably only have one parent. If they have two parents, the second parent probably isn't one they get along with because it's not a biological parent. Um, some of them have completely non-biological parents. Some of them live with their grandparents. Some of them have parents that are uh, like both in jail. That kid, those kids are the ones that are like the least willing to talk about their family and think they have no tools to work with. Um, and so they, they work jobs at this age. Like I had a few students online, which this was one of the, the beauties of being Title I and low socio. Most of my kids came back to school during COVID and we had a ish normal year, <laughs> as normal as it could possibly be in COVID. And that was because their parents had to go back to work and they didn't have a place to stay. The kids that I had online were either staying at home babysitting because they couldn't afford the babysitter, they were working at their parents' job, they were translating for their parents while their parents were going around cleaning houses because they realized my child as a translator makes me three times as much money as I was making before. So those were my children that were online for the most part. Okay, um, and then I had tons of them that were at school that are in that same situation but they had siblings that were all in school too, so they could come to school during the day, but then they go home and they're the parents. They may not see their parents because they're in bed before their parent wakes up, or before their parent gets home, and they're at school after their parent has already gone. They, they don't see their parents. So their parents, they might work jobs, they might be the family translator. So they have all these skills, but they don't view them as skills. And we have to view those as skills and then teach them how to use those skills with their teammates, with their band members, with their family at school. Because if they take care of their family members at home, that's gonna be your greatest leader in your band, is it not? Like that's gonna be your greatest leader. Um, if they're a translator, oh my gosh, fifth grade instrument day, that is your best kid on the planet. Because that's gonna be the kid that sits down with you at the table and translates for every family that can't speak, that are terrified that they're gonna have to rent instruments and things and they don't know the process. Um, and so we can use these tools that they already have packed in their little bag that they use all the time to, to support our program and support that kid and make them realize that they're bigger than they realized they were. Um, both of these tools come, sets of tools come with challenges. The students with toolboxes full of tools, they don't necessarily know how to use them all. <laughs> they just know that they have them. Um, and so those teachers have to go through teaching them how to use those tools. For us with the multi-tool kind of kids, we have to show them that you can use these tools in situations that aren't emergencies. Because you think of a multi-tool as an emergency, like, oh no, I don't have a screwdriver, <laughs> I'll grab this. But you can use that multi-tool for so many things to save yourself in so many situations. And so we have to teach them that their tools are just as good, we just have to use them in a slightly different way. Okay, um, and it's our job to teach that. Uh, their life outside of school is gonna look very different. And I've talked about 
the fact that they're the caregiver, the fact that they have jobs, the fact that some of them are homeless. Okay, some of them don't have parents. My school this next year, and my school that I've been at currently, is the feeder, all of the students from the homeless shelter come to us, all of the students from the um, foster care system, they go to the foster home instead of with foster families, come to us, and some of those students I only see for a month, but that doesn't mean they can't be a vital part of our program while they're there. Um, then we've got the motivation, and I think this is where people struggle with this group of students the most. How many people teach low socio kiddos? Okay, how many of them just don't seem motivated to do anything? Do you struggle, like they just, they don't care. They seem like they don't care. They care. But there's like these walls that they put up to protect themselves that makes it harder to get through. You have to kind of dig your way through those walls. Um, things that don't motivate these students. Grades, right? You're gonna fail my class. So, I don't care. No one's gonna yell at me at home, they're not there. They don't even know how to check my grades online and you don't mail them home. <laughs> Truth, okay? <laughs> um, threats of punishment, so punish me. What can you do to me that someone hasn't already done? Put me in ISS, yes, I get a room that's small by myself with other people like me. Um, being singled out. We're not gonna do that, right? If we're going down the room, we're like, hey, play that. I don't wanna do that, okay? Especially if you don't have a relationship with them, they don't wanna be singled out, okay? Motivating factors for these kids, belonging. And that's number one. If they feel like they belong, they will do just about anything for you. Food, mm -hmm. food will always motivate them <laughs> for obvious reasons. Group competition, once you've got the belonging, because they're very competitive humans. They won't put it up that out there as an advertisement to begin with. Family, and what better family than their band family? Because their band family might be the best family they have. Um, then another situation for them that's different is the perception of possible future outcomes. And when I showed this to my husband, he was like, what do you mean? Because this is, this is a tricky one. Everybody, well I won't say everybody, lots of people think that students in a low socio situation, they're there because of some tragic something that is continual and it's genetic, or I've had people tell me it's a genetic situation or it's a lack of um, desire to work hard and I, I've never found any of that to be true. However, what they experience at home is what they perceive of as their expected outcome. So if they see a parent at home that works three jobs, they expect to have to work three jobs. If their parents met in high school and had a baby before they graduated, well, that's what you're supposed to do. And so that makes their situation, like when you talk to one of these students about college, they look at you like, miss, you crazy. And I've had students do that. In fact, I have a student who is now a band director and doing phenomenal things with kids, that when he was in seventh grade looked at me and he goes, I will never go to college, miss. I have a single mom, my dad's in jail, and I don't have any way to ever pay for college. And I looked at him and said, that euphonium you're holding right now is gonna do it. And it did. And he's phenomenal, and he does the same thing for kids. He looks for schools like this to go work with. Um, our job is to show these kids that they have something else that they can look at other options than just the one that's been before them, that's been presented to them as this is how life is. And so I think it's also important to know the things that don't matter. And this will come back to some of us from TMEA. Things that don't matter. Parents' income, okay? That's their experience and their situation has nothing to do with their abilities. Their living arrangements. I have tons of kids that cannot practice at home. And that's why we have open practice rooms before and after school. And beyond that, I have the most awesome principal in the world. And she lets the kids get notes from their teachers if they're ahead in their work and their grades are awesome. And lets them come down to use our practice rooms during class when it's not their class time. 
because she understands that some of them can't practice in any other way because they go home and take care of their siblings or they live in an apartment or a hotel or a car. And those aren't good places to practice. Um, sorry, am I too quiet? Okay. <laughs> and then their likelihood to move. Like we have no control over that. And that's not a good reason to ignore a student who needs band. So we can't ignore that. Um, so that means we have to change the way we think as a teacher. It doesn't limit, we, none of these things limit the student's potential. Only we can limit their potential, okay? Um, and so my, my takeaway from this is students are capable of doing anything they believe they can do. We just have to give them the belief that they can do it. Um, the supreme importance is losing the deficit lens. Lots of people look at these kids and go, oh, they can't. Sure they can. It just might look different. Or you might have to work a little harder as a teacher, and it's okay. Because if we don't look at these kids as somebody that can't, instead we look at them as somebody is, they can, but maybe we have to crack the code. It's going to make it better. He's fine. You can keep him here. No, you're fine. I'm going to listen to it on the online. All right. <laughs> um, so how do we as educators lay the groundwork for the success. Um, in the classroom, procedures, and I know that sounds like, well, duh, lame, stupid answer, but I promise you the last week of school this last year, we went back to procedures one day. We shut class down, we packed that sucker up, and we started over. Because if we can't handle the procedures of class, we don't do anything else. And the kids hate it to begin with, but they love it in the long run. And I used to hear people say that and I'm like, oh, but it's true. Because they trust the situation when they know that they're safe and they know that the situation is what they're gonna expect. They need things to be routine and they need to see things that they, like I expect this to happen and it did in a positive way. Um, and then they need you to be consistent. Um, the worst thing I think we can do for these kiddos is have a schedule that's like, we have the same parts of class every day, but they go in a different order every day. And I'm giving them great pedagogical learning and I'm giving them great information, but each day I switch the order of things. They are gonna do so much better if the order is the same. In fact, I, had, I was given a kind of a hard time by one of my fellow directors at one time because I used to create a warm-up sheet for them that had everything from start to finish that I wanted. And they're like, there are a thousand books sitting in your band room that have all of that in it. And I'm like, yeah, but they have to turn pages. And turning pages gives them the opportunity to get lost. And turning pages takes time out of our rehearsal when we could just go through it and there's our daily drill. And we can actually focus on the skills of the daily drill because we're here instead of flipping through pages. And so I wouldn't change it upset them a little bit because they were my high school director, but it's okay. Um, positivity. It is really easy as directors to get super negative. There are so many things for us to be frustrated by inside and outside of the classroom. And if we take any of that in with us, the kids pick up on it because these kids are the most sensitive humans you will ever meet. They come off as being rock hard, but their little meters for your personality and your sensitivity and your anger or your happy meter are so good that they're gonna be able to tell. And they're gonna give back what they get. So if you are positive with them, they're gonna try to be more positive with you because they feel safer. Um, and then the hardest one, and this is something we work on all the time, is creating a safe and supported risk environment. In band, you can't succeed without risk. And these kids, don't like risk because risk could mean failure and risk could mean looking bad and we'd rather do something easy that we look good at and so we have to create an environment where it's safe and it's actually fun to try to do things that are scary um, the next thing is what we have to do for ourselves we have to have the best pedagogy because we probably aren't gonna have a lot of kids taking private lessons and unless you have a school district unlike mine that has some major secret cash fund that can go, here's money for private lessons. And you can pay these lesson teachers enough money to make it worth their time to come stay at your school. You're not gonna have a lot of kids in lessons. And people will make you feel bad about that. 
Um, because, like, well, if you just get a lesson program started, well, if you come live a month in my shoes, and we'll continue working to build that, that lesson program. I'm not gonna give up on it, because someday we're gonna figure it out. We're working on trying to find grants right now. We're working on trying to find companies that'll give us money. So it's not something that won't happen, but it's something that we don't have right now, which means I have to be the best flute teacher they can possibly have. I play the tuba. I have to be the, <laughs> I have to be the best clarinet player they've ever seen. Okay, I have to be the best pedagogy that they can possibly get their hands on, which means I have to go out and learn how to do it myself. My assistant director was texting me this morning because she was at her first saxophone private lesson with a professional private saxophone or professional saxophone player this morning because she is absolutely guaranteeing herself that she's going to be the best pedagogy that can be given to those saxophone kids in our beginner class. Um, and so we have to do that. It's worth our time and it's worth their lives for us to do that. We have to set high expectations. These kids aren't afraid of high expectations. They're afraid of high expectations being put on them with nothing to help back it up. If you give them high expectations and they go, that's the expectation, I'm out, they're not gonna achieve it. But if you're there to push them and support them and encourage them and lift them up the whole way, they're going to be able to do more than that. You need to teach and have. It starts with have. You have to have a growth mindset. And if you're not familiar with growth mindset, you need to check out a lady named Carol Dweck. She's done research on growth mindset. And it's truly, if you believe you can't do something, you won't. And if you can teach yourself to be open to trying anything, you're going to succeed. And we have to teach ourselves first and be the model because we're gonna ask the kids to have that growth mindset as well. And then the trickiest one, and this is one that we talk about a lot in my district, you have to speak their language. And for instance, in my first district, my students were very low English, very low English. They were all ESL. Um, and it was actually entertaining. I would bring in clinicians that were big name, and everybody knows them, and they're like, wow, you had her in your band room. And I would offend her every time, and I didn't mean to, but she would say something to the kids that was very high-level brain. And my kids would look at her with this blank stare. They wanted to do what she said, but they didn't understand a word she said. So I would rephrase what she said. And she didn't like that. It made her feel bad, because it was like I was insulting her when really I was just translating to a level that these kids could get. And then they'd be able to do what she said, but it hurt her feelings, and I never meant to do that. And so it took me finding that level of clinician that would be able to allow me to translate and be okay with it. And I found those, and there are those people out there. And it's easier if you go ahead and just go, all right, guys, this is my group. They don't understand English very well. They're on about a first, second grade level. So when you say something really brainiac and go ahead and say it brainiac, they need to hear those words. I'm going to translate. Because if they're hearing those words and they're hearing me translate, they're learning those words. And that's huge. Um, my new group, they are perfectly great English speakers, some of them better than mine. Some of them are a little bit more thug street than my other group. And so I speak their language now too. And I speak to them at their age level. I don't speak to them as this professional adult who must be, um, and it's really fun because I had, we had a new director come into our district and she, she has studied everyone and she is very prepared and she was speaking so politely and so professionally to these kids and they were like, and the minute she came to watch one of my rehearsals, she goes, oh my gosh, you talk so differently to these kids. And I was like, yeah, and she said she went back and changed up how she spoke and she was like, it was a night and day difference just because she was speaking their language. And she's better at it than I am now because she's a TikTok star with them and I'm like, I'm not going there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I am too old for TikTok, but she's got followers like you wouldn't believe for her flute video. So, um, <laughs> so it's really about speaking their language because the minute she was speaking their language, they all bought in and they would have done anything for her. Um, 
And then this has become one of my biggest struggles. And this was a big struggle this year because we just done COVID. And the last nine weeks of school, I wasn't allowed to teach because we were going to overload the parents. The electives were just gonna be too much. Um, and so I took a, a page out of the athletics department's book because they weren't allowed to do anything either. So they started having athletics challenges every day. So it was push-ups challenge. Video yourself playing as, or doing as many push-ups as you can. And then they post the top three. I was like, I can do this. So I would write out a four or eight measure little melody. Post it on their Google Classroom in the morning. They had until eight o'clock to send it in. At eight o'clock I'd listen to them and every kid that played it correctly got on our leaderboard for the day and we posted it on Facebook for their parents. My principals loved me because I wasn't creating content that was stressing their parents out. Kids could choose to participate if they wanted to, which they did. We usually had 60 to 80 kids participate per day, which was a crazy day for me because starting at eight o'clock, <laughs> I was listening to recordings until I was ready to pass out. And those people were sitting, waiting at their Facebook for the post of the day. Is my kid's name on there? And I would take the best video that I got or the best recording I got and I would send a quick message to the parent and go, can I post this for everybody to hear what it sounds like? Sure, of course, I would love for my kid to be famous playing Mary Had a Little Lamb. And it got crazy because I did the gummy bear song. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because the parents started cracking up because you know they have four kids at home, the youngest one is two, and we've been watching Gummy Bear Song until we're ready to vomit, okay? <laughs> and we've got um, Mama Shark. And so, like, every day I came up with something, and the kids were sending videos and recordings, and they were doing it. Because my biggest fear was I was gonna lose kids. Because, well, we didn't do anything in band, and band stinks now. Band's no fun. Well, of course band's no fun, because we aren't allowed to do anything. Band's not fun if we're not playing. And so when we came back in the fall, I was very nervous. I was like, I don't know what's gonna show up. They all showed up. And we got it done. Um, but the thing was, when they came back, it was, I don't really feel like doing any work. Because like, last nine weeks, I could put my name on it and I got 100. So I really don't wanna do any work anymore. So we had to start working, of course, right, right away. Here's your region music. You want me to what? We're gonna learn region music. So we had to learn about goals. And one of the biggest, like, break it down, everybody put your instruments down, we're gonna come to Jesus now, was talking about how to set goals. And, do you have a marker? I don't know if they work, but you can try to we'll find out. Oh yes, they work. Okay, so I, would, I looked at my kids and I said, okay, you have a, an assignment and it's really hard and we need to set a goal and so you're like man I know I can achieve right here this one is totally attainable so here is my happy little goal that I'm gonna set for myself I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna work to that attainable goal and so I had them sit down and write down exactly what they thought they were capable of doing with that region music and some of the answers were frightening because they were like, I'm not gonna be able to do that. I had seventh graders that had had three nine weeks of school having to learn all region music. And I was like, by golly, we're gonna figure this out. And so we set our attainable goal. Some of them were like, I might practice once a week. There wasn't even a goal for like what they were gonna be able to play. I said, okay, now set me a goal that's a little bit further out here. It's a little bit past your attainable goal. And they were like, okay. And here was where we hit like this brick wall. If they set this goal and they achieve it, they, they're a success, right? And all these kids want is to be a success. That's all they want. They want to feel like they accomplished something. And so often they don't get a chance to feel like they were a success at something. So they set something where they know this, they can succeed. So I looked at them and I said, well, what if you set this goal right here? That's a little higher. It's like, what's gonna happen if you work towards this goal? And they're like, well, we might get a little bit past the attainable goal. 
it was like, oh, but did you fail? And they, some of them were like, yeah, because I didn't hit my goal. I'm like, but if you got past what you could do, did you fail? Because the last thing they want to do is fail. And so it took us a while to get past the, this right here isn't a failure anymore. So what if you set a scary goal? And we called it that. We called it the scary goal. It's like, what would happen then? We're like, well, we might get past this goal. I'm like, are you a failure if you don't meet your goal? Uh, I don't know. Well, the reality is they started realizing, oh, okay, this whole like pass and fail thing has been made up by their teachers. And we talked about that too. And how our math teachers make us feel like there's a right and a wrong and there's no in between. And so we kind of worked on getting past that. We have to teach them this. And the next step to this whole thing that we did was we picked little tiny chunks that got us to each one of these stages which they've never seen or done that before because remember their parents aren't home. Who's gonna teach them that if we don't? Not their math teacher. Their math teacher is too worried about that star test. And so it's our job to teach them that skill. That skill right there is gonna make them want to do more things than they've watched people at their home do. Okay, and then the other part is they have to have time at the end for guided reflection because these kids are not going to reflect on anything on their own. They don't know how, they don't know why, and it makes them feel uncomfortable. Anything that makes them feel uncomfortable, they're not gonna do on their own. And so you have to take them through it. You have to show them how to do it. You have to show them how you do it, because we all reflect, because that's how we get good at what we do. Um, and you have to teach them that skill. Well, if they have the ability to set great goals and they have the ability to reflect on themselves and come back and redirect themselves into a better place, you just created a human that's gonna go places. And we haven't even talked about how their instrument works. Because that's all the fun part that goes along with learning these life skills we're teaching. So in Texas, we look at band and go, well, is your band successful? Did they get ones at UIL? Right? Because that's the end all be all. Is your band good? Let's go look up our UIL scores from the last four years. Right? You're applying for a job. Well, let's go look up those UIL scores before we start calling people. What do their scores look like? That's one day. And yes, it's huge. It's assessing a lot of things, but it's not assessing these kids the way they need to be assessed. It's not. Okay, we look at how many honor bands. <laughs> These kids may never make an honor band, and maybe they will. But if we're looking at, if we're trying to focus on honor band, they're not gonna be an honor band. That's the wrong focus. If we're looking at how many kids became band directors, okay, maybe. But I think a bigger question is how many kids graduated high school that probably wouldn't have? How many kids went on and did something beyond high school? And it doesn't have to be college, because college is stupid expensive right now. And maybe not the best answer for a lot of kids, because putting themselves in debt doesn't get them out of the situation that they're currently in. But are they going on to something better than the vision they had for themselves when they walked in your room? Okay, and so what I look for in my band room is do the kids love the band room? Is it their home? Because some of them, it's the only good home they have. That's not gonna be the math room. Okay, do the kids push themselves hard even when it's new? Okay, because the first one, like lots of kids love the band room, right? Lots of kids love the band room, that's an easy one. But do they push themselves to try hard even if it's new? That's one of those things, when I see all the kids starting to kind of click into that, I'm like, all right, we're on the right track now. Now I have something to be proud of. Do the kids take pride and ownership in the program, its achievement, and its future? There will always be that small group of kids that are those band kids that do that. But what about the, the group right after that? 
are they that way too? And the group after that, are they also really caring about what's happening at the younger kids' school? And then, do you have kids that want to share the love of music with others? Not necessarily as a band director. I have 20 some odd band directors out there right now around the state and actually in other states as well. Um, but maybe that's not how they want to share love of music. There are thousands of other ways. I have students that share love of music at church. They play in their community bands. There's lots of ways for them to share the music, okay? So those are ways to see, is my band program really being successful? Because those ones at UIL feel great when you get them, but they're not guaranteed especially with a group of kids that when you go out in public and risk is involved, they may completely turn into different humans. It's possible. Um, honor band, there's only one of those per year. And right now there aren't any, right? And so look at those things. Ask yourself, do your kids love the band room? Okay, you're on the right track if, that's, if answer number one is yes. Do they push themselves to try hard? If not, We've got to create a safer environment where it's fun to try hard and make mistakes. Mistakes are okay. And how many kids come to you and they're like, oh, I don't want to mess up. Mess ups are like the first out, I'm out. But making mistakes are totally cool. And so we celebrate mistakes in our room. Like we high five, we talk about ways we can fix it. We give them a chance to fix it. We high five again. And it's a happy situation when we make mistakes because we know we're learning. Um, and I'll ask them all the time, what happens if you mess up? And they all like go back, nothing. And then we keep going. <laughs> I don't even like, I don't even have to finish this, nothing. So um, do they take pride in ownership in the now, the future, and the achievements that your kids are making? And do they want to share the love of music with others? Because if they do, then you've affected their trajectory and they know that they can affect someone else's trajectory in the process. So um, at the bottom of your, or on the back of your sheet, I just gave you some cool resources and then I put my articles if you wanna go back and read because I didn't specifically talk in depth about any of them but they, like, they'll all go in depth about the different areas. Um, but also there's information about Eric Jensen and Carol Dweck. Um, Carol Dweck's TED Talk is amazing. It, it's really, it was kind of, it's just inspiring. So. All right, let's do some questions. I'm gonna ask the first question. So okay. I went back to teaching band from, I did private lessons for 10 years. Of course, I'm working with kids that can afford lessons for the most part, you know, and I mostly taught in either upper income or very mixed um, income, not ever in a real low socioeconomic. And when I went back to work, I was at a job where someone walked out in January. It was a school in downtown Austin. And um, I remember calling Annette and being like, at first I went back and reread her articles. And then I remember calling her and the biggest thing that I got from talking to her that, and the articles was not to take things personally. Because um, I'm used to when a kid doesn't want to do what I want or if they say something, I think they are personally like telling me no and I take it as though it's against me. And that was a big takeaway I had. So I just wanted to point that out. That yeah. She was much better at explaining to me like that's, that's either what they've been around or that's their um, way to protect themselves or yeah. whatever, it has nothing to do with you. And I realized later when I did leave at the end of the year, those kids are, it's a revolving door. Mm -hmm. I mean, those kids have new teachers day to day. And it's not just the band room. Month to month, year to year. Not Every just class. the band room. So they, they knew like, I was not gonna be someone that just walks in and they trust me. Right, and I, that's huge. And I don't know why I didn't even put that in there, but. Um, that's that's such a big deal because they're so used to hurt in their lives that that's their first sometimes their first I'm gonna get you that has nothing to do with you it's just that's how they react to things and so you can't take it personally um, you can't take it personally when they do things wrong on purpose you can't take it personally when they refuse to do stuff none of that is your fault none of that is your fault now it is your fault if you get aggressive with them about it because then you're pushing them further into that place where they're not going to do it. If instead you come up with creative workarounds, you go, all right, I'm gonna flip the game. And I think that's when you started coming up with all your games. Mm -hmm. Like Especially her game design blew up because she's like, oh, we need to turn this into something that's not 
like in your face. It needs to kind of be and back they, door they teaching. They couldn't really read music. They only knew five yeah. notes and they didn't know how to read them. So yeah. we started doing music theory games and rhythm games and it was a different way and they were very successful. I made them real easy and fun and the kids yeah. could be successful. And that's huge. If you can make them feel successful, they want more. They want more. They want to be good. They want to be successful. You just have to make them feel like that's something they can achieve. And once they achieve it and they like get a taste of it, they're like, ah, okay, I'll, I'll try a little. Okay, I'll try something a little harder. And so that's, that's how you develop that risk like atmosphere in your room where it's safe to risk because risk is fun and not terrifying. So, thank you. And I think we agree this is all good, I mean, good teaching for anyone, yeah. right, in any situation. Mm -hmm. But I really, after going from the very, very highest socioeconomic to some of the toughest socioeconomic, it, it just is so much more important for those kids. And I just feel like it's harder to get through to them. But I mean, making high socioeconomic kids not feel anxious and have success, of course, is very important too. Yeah. But I feel like she's well, just Well, and how hard is it too when you have the mix where you have the really high and the really low? Because the really high are like go-getters and the really low are like, Nope. And not they can having. hide behind. Yeah, they can hide. And that's something we've struggled with this year. And we, we've always worked really hard to not let them hide. And what was really telling, it was one of those moments we were like, oh my gosh. Like, these kids had worked their tails off for us all year. And now we're splitting schools. And so we were doing leadership training that we do every year. But we would spend the last little bit of leadership each time split, at the two, split into the two new middle schools. So the group that was getting to know their new director could meet her, and my group could talk to me. And it was hysterical because that group over there was loud and yelling and jumping up and down and going crazy, just trying to talk. And my group was like, and it was like, oh my gosh. And these kids work terribly hard for me, and they are not afraid to raise their hand and answer things. But even in that scenario, they were uncomfortable and hiding. And so we've actually um, come up with, and it's my assistant director, she's come up with some fantastic ideas of ways we're going to use that to our advantage. Use our quiet leadership to be something that's great instead of something that doesn't get much done. Because quiet leadership can get it done just as good as, in fact, sometimes better than loud leaders. The other thing that can happen when you have the big mix is that you focus so much on those kids that are tearing it up and they're like, gone. And really, could a monkey have taught them how to be great? And then there's this group of kids over here that just disappear from band later. When we could have made that kid someone special that could have been just as good as all or better than those kids. Okay, and I have one of those that just finished at UT. He was in the wind ensemble at UT as an undergrad. And he was that kid in sixth grade. He could have been the one that sat back and was quiet, and I wouldn't allow it. And he, I gave him extra work to do. And then I had a parent come in and give me money to give one private lesson away for the perpetuity of their education from sixth through twelfth grade. So I gave it to him, and it was there were specifications, and it fit everything with that child. And his lesson teacher started working with him and was like, "This kid's going to be amazing." So he bought him a box strat. This kid could have been one year band and done. By second semester of sixth grade, I moved him up to a band because he had done everything I needed him to do in sixth grade. And I could have ignored him if I'd had a huge population of super successful children and he would have disappeared into the woodwork and be working at Pakistan. And so it's huge that we don't miss these kids, even if we're teaching a high socioeconomic school. Those are the kids that need you the most. So. What other questions? Uh, how do you define the line between being sensitive to a situation and also not making excuses for not meeting expectations? That's tough. That's tough. And I get accused by other band directors all the time of making excuses for my kids. And I have forever. And I've had to just kind of let it roll off my back. Um, you have to use your gut. And I know that sounds like the lamest answer ever, but it's gonna be different for every kid. And so if they're not able to meet this expectation, well, can they meet it close? Because if you can get them close, can you push them the rest of the way? Probably. And if they're feeling successful at this expectation, 
They might want this one next. But you're never giving up. And that's the thing I think people have the hardest time with because they're, at some point it's like, well, you didn't meet my expectations, peace, right? Um, now, places that I put my foot down, if they are causing problems for everyone else or they're destroying our learning environment, I put my foot down there because that's not okay for any of the other kids. Now, do I have a child that was like master of destruction for a while that now is a fantastic human? Yes. Did I fix that in class? Not at all. Because <laughs> if I had worked on that child in class, it would have just blown class up. And so he and I were a one-on-one -on -one situation and my assistant and he were a one-on-one -on -one situation and we tag teamed that boy because he didn't want to be good at anything because that meant there were expectations of him doing more. And at the end of the year, she pulled him in and she said, you know, you're really fantastic at playing the euphonium. It's a real shame you're quitting band. And he was like, and the only, like, the only face he ever makes it us, really. She was like, yeah, I want you to go home and think about it. And here's the reasons why. That kid signed up for band next year. And we were both going, at the beginning of the year, we're going, oh my gosh. But the whole time, I kept going, I'm supposed to hate this kid, but I like this kid. And if we can find it, he's going to be an amazing music kid. And he's about this tall and thinks he's going to be a football star. <laughs> His mom is about this tall, and she thinks he's going to be a football star. And maybe he's going to be a football star. He's going to be a rock star euphonium player while he plays football. Would you agree praise in public, criticize in private? Yes, but sometimes praise in public can be a destructive situation too. Yep. Agreed. Oh, yeah. um, some of them don't like to be praised. Um, and so you have to know, like, if you know the kid doesn't like praise in public, I write notes all the time. And they, I mean, those kids, they put them in their binder. And you'll see it in their binder. There's that little note that I wrote to them telling them. Sometimes I'll hide it in their locker. Um, we do, our school, of course, does these, like, oh, this kid was awesome. They get a free ice cream. And if I do that with some of these kids, I have to go to the principal and say, this kid does not want their name announced. You just need to slip this to them. Or... If you'd rather give me the coupon, I'll give them the coupon for the ice cream because they don't want their name announced on the, the overhead or on the intercom because that is the most mortifying thing that could ever happen to them. Mm -hmm. And so you have to know your kids, okay? And you can't know your kids by standing up in front of them and teaching them skills, okay? And the skills are important, and that's what we focus all our, our time on. But we spend our time getting to know those kids. And I'm so excited because I finally get to have sixth graders. That's when you get to know them the best mm -hmm. because it's like we're focusing on one thing and we can get to know each person. And I've been getting them in 90s and 100s as seventh and eighth graders in full band. <laughs> and I have to get to know that like this. Um, and so getting to know those kids, knowing do they like praise in public or not. Some of them love it. Some of them don't do it. Some of them would love to have the negative in front of everyone. I wouldn't recommend it anyway because they use it for attention. But it really depends on the kid. Um, in our situation, we have a pretty mixed like socioeconomic status mm -hmm. until eighth grade when band becomes optional. Right. And then at the point, it seems like all of the ones with the upper socioeconomic economic status move towards the sports. Right. And then we end up with all the ones with the lower status in band. Absolutely, and I get that. I've trying to come up with a way to eliminate that. Yeah. I've been working on that for three years and haven't made a dent. It's been like that for at least 10. Um, part of it is just making the connection with the kids. Part of it is making the connection with the kids. Part of it is making sure the community is aware that you can do all the things and making it a big deal about doing all the things and bringing attention to the kids that do all the things. Part of that sounds like your school district needs to look at what they're doing with those kids that are low socio that aren't doing athletics because it sounds like your district's kind of letting them go. When there's probably some great athletes well, some in that bunch too. Some of them are doing it. It's, it's not so much that the, the low socios are leaving. Some of them are willing to do both. Okay. But like we might have a, a fantastic player yeah. who's of the upper socioeconomic and there's there's no keeping them. Their brother quit band, their sister quit band, their grandmother quit I guess that. Like, and that's all, hard. If it's a generational thing, yeah. that's a hard thing to yeah. fight. That's a hard thing to fight because they've got their parents in their ear going, you have to choose now. Mm -hmm. So it's our job to do the best we can to make them understand 
that you can do all the things and doing all the things makes you a better human because you're gonna be able to handle things as you go to college because you're gonna, you have already been able to manage your time. Um, and then I would say the next step I would take in that situation is up my pedagogy game as hard as I can because if my content is great, those kids aren't gonna quit. So are, do they go to you as a high school director or do they go to another director as a high school director? No, it's, it's all the same. Right, yeah. okay. Um, and so if, it's, if they're moving with you, mm -hmm. up the pedagogy game. Because if the pedagogy game is like A-list, they're not gonna quit. They're not gonna quit. Because they know that you know your stuff and that you're working hard. So we're gonna go ahead and stop, we're out of time. Y'all give okay. Ms. Mitchell a hand. Thank you, online people. This will be available for 48 hours and I have posted a link to the handout. Thanks so much for being here online. We will have another sh uh, stream on this same Facebook or YouTube channel. In